we were looking at oscillators we saw the double integrator oscillator the lc oscillator and also the wayne bridge oscillator wayne bridge oscillator all of them essentially work in the same way you have some positive feedback at a particular frequency so that when you start off the oscillator the poles start on the right off plane and you will get a natural response that is exponentially blowing up but eventually the nonlinearities in the circuit will limit the amplitude of the oscillation the nonlinearities can be implicit like the saturation of the op amp or uh, the controlled current source like we used in the lc oscillator or it could be that you design the nonlinearities explicitly so that it limits at a particular amplitude okay so wayne bridge and uh, oscillators like that essentially they have an amplifier in a feedback loop that feedback loop is uh, another feedback loop the amplifier itself may have a negative feedback loop like we have it's a non inverting amplifier and uh, there is another feedback around the amplifier which is frequency selective we saw that the attenuating network it gives you a, a real number as the attenuation factor only at a particular frequency so what happens is that it will oscillate at that frequency and also the whether it will oscillate or not depends on the gain of the amplifier okay so in the particular case of the wayne bridge oscillator when the time constant of the two rc networks were equal that is when we made it like this this is the output of the amplifier and this is the input and this has a gain k and let's say these are identical so in this case this will oscillate for k what's the condition huh greater than 3 and it doesn't oscillate for k less than that so now that gives you an op to turn to either let it oscillate or not now we saw that this could be implemented using a non inverting amplifier if r2 by r1 is 2 or more the gain will be 3 or more okay in that case it will oscillate and a way to control it is for instance you can make r1 variable so you could have for instance an amplitude detector we probably won't have time to discuss how to make this but i think you have made one in the lab right using a peak detector or something there are ways of making essentially you make a rectifier and either try to detect the peak or the rms value or the rectified average value it gives you a measure of the amplitude you have now there is first a feedback loop to make the amplifier there is a frequency dependent feedback loop to make the oscillator and you can introduce yet another feedback loop to control the amplitude and how do you do that i will show it only in an abstract sense you compare it with some reference voltage let's say that is the desired amplitude and you have an integrator or essentially a high gain amplifier with a pole which controls the uh controls the value of the resistance and it has to be in the correct sense that is if the amplitude is too much what should you do to r1 if the amplitude is too high what should happen to r1 it should increase so that it will go away from the oscillating region okay so if the polarities are all like this and we if we assume that this control voltage uh monotonically increases the conductance this is fine but anyway i mean you have to see the sense of the uh feedback okay so you will have also an amplitude control loop so in this case 
it will oscillate at a frequency 1 by r c and an amplitude of v ref. I am assuming that this amplitude detector gives you exactly what the amplitude here is and that will be made equal to v ref. The output of the amplitude detector will be made equal to v ref. Okay. So, I would not go into any further details, but uh, if you have an amplitude detector you can make this and you need to also have a variable resistor R 1 okay. and that can be implemented using MOS transistors and so on. And we also saw a particular implementation which implicitly combines the amplitude detector and the variable resistor which was to stick a light bulb in place of R 1 okay. so which I told you also was uh, the first product of Hewlett Packard. Okay. And you can think of a variety of amplitude detectors and the ways to complete this feedback loop and so on. Any questions about this? Any of the harmonic oscillators? You have a feedback loop where you have the loop gain hovering around minus 1 at a particular frequency and you have another feedback control loop. So, that the loop gain moves in the appropriate direction depending on the amplitude that is in a nutshell how do you make an amplitude stabilized oscillator. Okay. If you did not care about the waveform you would not do this you would have an amplitude uh, detector and all this stuff you would simply make the loop gain slightly more than uh, uh, I mean slightly more negative than minus 1 or you make the gain of the amplifier slightly more than 3 to start with. So, that it is guaranteed to start up after that it will go and give you a slightly I mean non sinusoidal waveform that is ok. Actually, there is a large number of applications where it is the periodicity of the waveform that matters that is every period has to be equal to the other all the other periods deviations from periodicity should be small, but the waveform need not be sinusoidal you could have a square wave and in fact many times a square wave is desired. Okay. When you clock digital logic circuits you even if you have a sinusoidal waveform you would probably try to make it a square wave before using it as a clock right. Any questions about this? So, this is a frequency dependent uh, network we saw that the ratio of this voltage to that voltage is a real number at a particular frequency and if we have R c R c it will be at 1 by R c and the ratio is one third. So, that is why if you have a gain of 3 everything works fine. Okay. This is the oscillator we discussed so far. Can you see any relationship between this and the problems that you had in quiz 1? Quiz 2, I think, yeah. Is there a relationship or no? There were some networks like this, right? So, one way to think about this is that this is what we have done now. If we have V p cos omega naught t, where omega naught equals 1 by r c, at this point we will get what do we get? What do we get? V p by 3 cos omega naught 
50 and then you make it self sustaining with an amplifier of gain 3. Okay. The other ways of uh, doing the same thing instead of using a passive attenuator let us say I make it make it something like this this is z 1 and z 2. Okay. I mean this is z 1 z 2 right. Assuming that the op amp is in negative feedback which means this is at virtual ground what is V B by V A? I mean what will be V B by V A? minus z 2 by z 1 and will it be real at a particular frequency and how much is it? Hmm? At 1 by r c. So, at 1 by r c what is the value? Eh? Minus minus how much? minus 2 right, because uh, the impedance of this branch is r t square root 2 with a phase lag of 45 degrees and this is r divided by square root 2 with the same phase lag. So, this is okay. sorry minus uh, yeah minus 2. Okay. So, if I apply V p cos omega naught t here omega naught being 1 by r c I would get 2 V p cos omega naught Okay. And instead of uh, this being R and C, if this was alpha R and C by alpha, what is the frequency at which V B by V A is a real number? Same, okay. but uh, what will be the value of V B by V A at that frequency? Uh, minus 2 alpha. Okay. So, this will be 2 alpha and here also we will have 2 alpha okay. only at this, this particular frequency. So, this is also some sort of frequency selective network. Now, how do you turn this into a self sustaining oscillator? What do you have to do? What do you have to do? I mean similar to here I said that if I apply V c V p cos omega t I get one third of that. So, I throw in an amplifier again 3 so that it becomes self sustaining. So, similarly what can you do here? Attenuator. Okay. Now, that also can be done in any number of uh, ways, but I chose to make take the inverting amplifier, but it is not actually amplifying. right? what should be the ratio r 2 by r 1? Huh? r 2 by r 1 should be 1 by 2 alpha. Okay. So, will this work? Actually, I think I had a made a slight mistake here. This is this should be minus 2 alpha omega uh, 2 alpha V p cos omega naught t and this should give you a gain of minus 2 alpha minus 1 by 2 alpha. So, then it will become self sustaining is it okay? All this is basically massaging around the Wayne bridge oscillator to get other topologies. So, if you now break this loop and look for uh, loop gain being minus 1 or the self sustaining condition, you apply a sinusoidal voltage at some frequency and the return stuff should be exactly the same amplitude and frequency. So, then you can kind of switch out your voltage source and connect this and nothing will change. Okay, You will get the conditions. And now, you can assign the signs to have negative feedback for both op amps that is not difficult. Okay. 
any questions here so this was one of the topologies given i think alpha was 2 or something now how did we get the other topology i think uh, set of you had a different type of oscillator huh what is the dual i mean instead of using z2 in feedback and z1 as the input i use z1 in feedback and z2 as the input okay that can be done also right so let's say i choose rc i don't remember what values i had given what is the frequency at which vb by va is a real number ha huh? 1 by rc and what is the value at 1 by rc what's the value minus minus half in this case it is attenuating so it means that if you apply vp cos omega not t omega not being 1 by rc you will get Minus V P by two cos omega naught t. And how do you turn this into a self-sustaining oscillation oscillator? Gain of minus two. Yeah. So for that you need an inverting amplifier. Okay. you can uh, essentially you know the network and the balance condition so you can come up with any number of oscillators now of course if you uh, throw in all the practical uh, features of the op amp and so on some of these may be better than others but as far as just getting a sustaining oscillation with uh, ideal op amps is concerned all these are the same okay now there is some uh, practical implication in fact if you read that jim williams's article in the book i mentioned you will probably see that what is the difference between this oscillator and either this or that one in the way the op amp is used or the kind of signals that the op amp sees is there any difference i mean this looks wasteful right okay it's okay for exam problems where you solve for something or the other why would you use two op amps in place of one any guesses I men we have not discussed this but you can kind of recall all the features or non ideal features of the op amp and then see what happens feedback is here now everywhere the ac feedback is positive otherwise it won't oscillate okay in that here we have a non inverting amplifier and if you think of this as an amplifier and this is the feedback network the feedback network also has no negative sign i mean the feedback fraction has no negative sign here if you think of this as the amplifier i mean it's attenuating but anyway that's okay so and this has the frequency dependent feedback network both have negative signs okay and so in this case offset is not actually very relevant for oscillators but some other feature of the what other characteristic is op amp have we discussed bandwidth yeah it will have some effect but i don't know what effect it has that's not the common mode voltage is the so let's say here the output amplitude is vp cos omega not t what is the common mode voltage for the op amp what is the common mode voltage it's the average of the two input voltages right the difference of the input voltage of the op amp is nearly zero as long as you have high enough loop gain okay let's assume that's the case what's the common mode voltage of the op amp what is it common mode input voltage of the op amp the average of the two input voltages what is that 
how much? One third, right? So you get one third here, one third there. I mean, if you assume an ideal op amp, basically there is some. Okay, so I'm just pointing this out as a fact. We have not done the analysis of what this common mode voltage will do, but what is the common mode inputs of the op amps here? Zero. Okay, because this is nearly at virtual ground. This is at ground. So is this. So it turns out that this has some implications on distortion. So, if you make these oscillators with uh, similar op amps and if the distortion it could be that the distortion is dominated by the common mode behavior of the op amp in that case these op amps which have zero common mode voltages are better. Okay. So, in general if you look at the inverting op amp inverting amplifier structure the input common mode is zero right because one of the inputs of the amp op amp is at ground the other one is nearly at ground. So, the average is very close to zero. Whereas, if you look at non inverting amplifier structure, the inputs of the op amp are very nearly equal to the input voltage itself. Okay. So, the common mode signal seen is quite large in the non inverting structure and very small in the inverting structure. So, that is why in practice you see as far as possible you try to make inverting type structures where the virtual node voltage is at 0. You cannot always do this and the non inverting structure does have some advantages like having infinite input uh, resistance and so on. So, that is why you use it, but as far as possible you use it in the you use it in this mode. Okay. Again this is some practical detail that I am uh, uh, giving you. You will be able to understand this only if you build op amps and uh, analyze the non ideality, build uh, the circuits and analyze non ideal features and so on. Okay. So, any questions? You could in principle take any amplifier and have a frequency dependent feedback network around it and build an oscillator and in fact, many of the tutorial problems are of that type. Okay. I think there was a, was there a question like this? What should be the Will it oscillate and what should be the value of k for it to oscillate? Huh? 56. 56? I mean, I could be misremembering this, but that is not the value I remember. Huh? 18. 29. some number it is not I do not think it is 18 or 56, but anyway you can calculate that. There is also one more version of this where the stages are buffered from each other that is in fact, this we have evaluated in a different context in the class. Okay. What should be the gain here? Huh? 18. 8 8 or 18 18 how many say 18 how many say 8 those of you who got 8 as the answer does not it ring a bell it is 8 is also the answer to something else <laughs> what is it the answer to when you have 3 poles in uh, negative feedback loop the uh, DC loop gain has to be 8 and it will be oscillate. So, that is why it was useless as an amplifier if you have 3 identical poles. So, this is exactly the same case right you have 3 identical poles in a negative feedback loop. The the circuit on the left side is uh, slightly different in that you have loading of one section uh, from the other. So, the poles will not be identical here okay. and the gain will be different go and evaluate it properly I do not think it is either 18 or 9 or 36 uh, or 56 okay. it is some other number, <laughs> but uh, I mean I am assuming of course, was this uh, were all the R's and C's identical. So, you can evaluate it. Okay. So, for this it is 8 right because you will get 8 by 1 plus s by p 1 cube and at a particular frequency this becomes uh, the loop gain becomes minus 1 and it will oscillate. Okay. So, the gain here has to be actually minus 8 right is it okay. So, yeah I mean uh, many very quite easy to generate problems of this type and I also told you that uh, many times you try to make an amplifier and it will tend to oscillate. 
ok any other questions on oscillators of any type I mean either the wean bridge or the double integrator or uh, the LC oscillator. So, there are two types one where you need sinusoidal waveforms and one where you do not and typically I would say most of the applications you do not because you are looking to generate a periodic signal not a sinusoidal signal. So, in those cases you would not worry about like careful amplitude stabilization and so on ok and actual waveform can be anything. In fact, in the Schmidt trigger uh, oscillator that you have you have uh, uh, waveform that is either a triangular wave or a square wave ok and a lot of times you get something that is neither a square one nor a sine wave and you make it as close to a square wave as possible for clocking digital circuits ok. So, there are oscillators which use physical L C s. So, that is what I call an L C oscillator because some other oscillators also when you have two capacitors like the double integrator you can take a section of the circuit and then it follows the V i relationship of an inductor, but that is not what I call an L C oscillator. L C oscillator means there is a physical inductor it stores energy in its magnetic field and a capacitor. So, this is these are the best oscillators among the types that we have discussed best in the sense that the periodicity is very good. Meaning like anything else if you look at the actual duration of each period they will be different from each other ok. The amount of deviation is the smallest for L C oscillators. So, we will leave it at that there are ways to define deviations from periodicity just like there are ways to define noise and so on, We but we will not worry about that. And then there are what are known as ring oscillators which we did not explicitly discuss, but essentially they follow this you have three or more amplifiers in a negative feedback ring and it will start oscillating and how you would do how would you implement this if you have inverters which are also amplifiers in some region of operation in a ring it will oscillate ok. So, they are kind of the next best and then you have other what are known as harmonic oscillators like the double integrator or the Wien bridge double integrator using op amps I mean. And finally, you have what are known as relaxation oscillators. I would classify the Schmidt trigger oscillator in this. And in general as you go up from the bottom you have a better periodicity and also higher maximum frequency that is the highest frequency L C oscillator that you can design will be at a much higher frequency than the highest frequency ring oscillator or definitely which will be better which will be higher than the highest frequency relaxation oscillator and so on ok. Again you do not have to worry too much about the details these are some facts that I am giving you ok because we are not going to analyze these aspects of those oscillators anyhow. Yeah. Oh, but uh, this itself is a buffer right because this is not drawing any current. As long as you do not draw any current from this you will get that ok. I did not draw another buffer here because I mean this is also I assume this something with a high impedance right if I write it as a block diagram like this. So, because if I have one more buffer of uh, gain 1 what difference does it make nothing. No, no I did not uh, say that it is uh, I mean the way I uh, if I write it as a block diagram I implied that it has no current that is being drawn, but if it has current drawn yeah you have to use a buffer. Okay. So, in that case yeah you have to have a buffer and in fact a ring oscillator is the three stages will be identical you can think of it as stages gains of minus 2, minus 2 and minus 2. So, that will give you oscillation ok. 
I mean again I am assuming no current is drawn here. So, uh, have you seen the ring oscillator in some digital course? You stick three inverters in a ring and it will start oscillating. This is exactly what it is, okay. Of course, it will go into, oh, you have not seen it. So, you may have seen odd number of uh, inverters in a ring. This, the way it is explained with the logic is that perhaps you have logic 1 here that will induce a logic 0 here, that will induce a logic 1, it will induce a logic 0 which is the same as this and now everything will invert, this will become 1, this will become 0, that will become 1 and the cycle repeats, okay. But actually how if you have all those voltages at the same value, let us say half the supply voltage, the poles will be in the right half plane and the oscillations will build up, it will get limited by the supply voltage, okay. So, it is an oscillator that conforms to the description that we had, but because you have delays you can vaguely describe it like that. And you can have, I mean, in this particular topology, because each one is an inverter or an inverting amplifier, you have to have an odd number of stages, so that you have DC negative feedback, but AC positive feedback. Okay, so the minimum number is three. So this is what is known as a ring oscillator. So the CMOS inverter is also an amplifier. To oscillate, to make it an oscillator. Ah, then I mean, this is an oscillator. You used it to make an amplifier, probably, and use a. You biased it, and used it as an amplifier. This is an oscillator. Okay. Anyway, let's not get into the details of this. We can discuss it offline if you want. But uh, if you have one inverter and put it in uh, self bias, I don't think it'll oscillate. Does it? It shouldn't. If it oscillated, you had better redo the experiment now. No, that is what that is the flaw with that kind of explanation. So, it looks like I mean this depends on what is inside the inverter, okay. A logical inverter again, I do not want to go too much into the detail. This is an inverter, and if I strictly from the logic function point of view, you cannot distinguish between this and that, okay. So, this means something, it means that it has only one stage of amplification for me, for an analog designer, okay. For a digital designer, for a I mean, as far as logic is concerned, this and this are the same. So, if you put this in feedback, it will oscillate. If you put a single stage in feedback, it will not. I mean, a single pole circuit will not oscillate. So, you have to be careful also while doing this. In fact, that amplifier experiment, there are things that are sold as inverters which have three stages like this. Logically, they will perform exactly the same function and there is no problem, but you cannot use that with a resistor as feedback and use it as an amplifier that will start oscillating, okay. Any other questions about oscillators? So, they are widely used like I said every chip whether it is analog or digital will have oscillators because I think without clock you cannot do anything, clock is what defines the steps for any algorithm. So, everything happens at some clock edge, okay. So, we have uh, looked at amplifiers, we have looked at filters, we have looked at oscillators and we can kind of finish off the course by looking at a couple of other blocks which use these clocks and which are also essential components of analog systems. Okay. I think earlier I must have shown you a block diagrammatic picture where you have continuous time signals and that gets converted to a digital signal and then is processed by a digital signal processing core. Now, we the amplifiers and so on are continuous time input, continuous time output. Now, we will look at some circuits which uh, kind of uh, give you a feel for how to go from continuous time to discrete time domain basically sampling and quantization. So, how do you take a continuous time signal and turn it into discrete time signal? What do you have to do it? Multiply it by? Okay, but how do you make a circuit that multiplies with an impulse strain? 
what do you do what is that function called i mean sampling so how do you sample a signal i mean give me any idea switching and i mean sampling the word actually almost tells you everything that you want to know so so if this is vi and <coughs> let's say you have a periodically operated switch s1 and i'll just show it as a logic uh, signal right i think this we have used while discussing dc dc converters and so on so this signal s1 means that whenever it is high the switch is closed and whenever it's low it is open okay and this vi is some continuous time signal like that what will be vo what will be vo whenever s1 is high that part will be so when s1 is high essentially we have a connection here right so vo will be equal to vi maybe we have more and so on right and when s1 is low what happens eh it will retain its value that is the important thing right i mean for instance if we have a capacitor we had a resistor what would happen it will go to zero so but here it will retain the value and then jump to the next this thing retain the value here jump to this jump to that okay isn't this when the switch is uh, open there is no path for any current from the capacitor so it will hold whatever value it had just before the instant that the switch was open okay and when it is closed it simply follows the input is this okay is the operation clear all we have is a switch followed by a capacitor and i'm assuming that this is an ideal voltage source vi so when the switch is closed the output voltage simply equals the input voltage and when the switch is open it will hold the value that was on the capacitor just before the switch is open okay so is this sampling in some way is it sampling what is it sampling it is sampling the value of vi just before the switch was open okay a block like this this is called a track and hold because it is tracking the input in one of the clock phases different states of the clock are known as phases i mean the clocks that we discuss have only two phases either on or off but you can have a collection of waveforms where you have multiple phases that are defined multiple states right so in this case in one phase of the clock when the clock is high it uh, the output tracks the input and in the other phase it holds the last tracked value okay effectively it is doing sampling if you look at these constant values okay so these are basically sampled just before s1 falls to zero okay so with a switch and capacitor you can sample any questions here about the track and hold why there is a resistance it will decay but uh, the way i have shown it there is nothing right that's it so i will let's not worry about the non ideal features of this again if you do have a leakage in the capacitor that limits how sh- how long the interval can be right by making the interval shorter and shorter you can get around the effects of leakage now this is a track and hold that is fine but 
let us say I did not want this uh, tracking phase at all that is what I want is a waveform that does something like this. It should be like that and then it should jump to the next sample and the next sample and the next sample value. You may have seen this kind of waveform right, it is called a sampled and held waveform. Have you seen this in signals and systems? No. So, you are taking samples here and the output is a continuous time waveform, but it jumps from one sampled value to the next. You must have seen this somewhere, yeah. So, how do I get that? I do not want this business of tracking the input in half the time, right. All I want is I want to sample hold that value until the next sampling instant, hold that value until the next sampling instant and so on. Is it? You have positive duty cycle of S1. What should I do? Ah, how should I change it? You are saying make the duty cycle so small that the on period is very small, okay. Yeah, that is a, a reasonable idea, but uh, the problem with that is the following, okay. Again, we will not discuss the non idealities in any detail, but what he is saying is, yeah, that is actually a, you make the tracking window so narrow that it is almost as though it is not there, okay. So, that is possible, right. Is that okay? Will that work? Essentially, what he is saying is you make this tracking uh, window very narrow, okay. So, it looks like it will work or no. What is the problem? Yeah, in reality, the switch will have resistance, this voltage source will have some resistance. So, you should leave enough room for the capacitor to charge, that is the problem. Otherwise, this uh, will work, okay. So, what should I do now? I mean, a more uh, uh, practical. Huh? D latch, what is the output of a D latch? No, no, but what kind of an output does a D latch give you? Logical output, right? Not a analog output, not an analog output, okay. Okay, S1 bar, right? That is what you mean. S1 bar, I mean that means the logical complement of S1. Is that going to work? I mean essentially when S1 goes to 0, S1 bar goes to 1. Is that what you mean? Will this work? Essentially what I want to do is, I have this blue stuff which is tracking in uh, these portions and holding in the intermediate periods. If I have another one which is tracking this and holding that, tracking this and holding that, tracking this and holding that, that is exactly what I want, right. So, essentially I need two track and holds which are operating in opposite phases. One operates with S1, the other one operates with S1 bar. Does it sound reasonable or no, right. During the hold period of the first track and hold, the second one should be tracking. I mean after all the input is already held, the fact that the second one is tracking, but the, during the tracking period the input is not changing. So, it does not matter. So, you will get a waveform like this. Is that convincing or no? Right. First let us forget the circuit that we have. You have a track and hold. That means that it tracks the input for uh, half the period and holds it for the other half. Now, you have a second track and hold it is arranged so that it is tracking when the first one is holding. So, the output of the second one will always be held even when it is tracking the input was constant and when it is holding it is like the same constant. So, it will give you a waveform that is like that. Is that okay? But does the circuit actually do that? Think about it we will continue from there. 